Hello, baseball fans. You're watching On Deck with Tyler Redman. Welcome to On Deck. We are honored today to be joined by former Cincinnati Red, former New York Met, and Montreal Expo. Am I missing any, Doug? Oh, yeah, you're missing a couple. <laughs> <laughs> Good to be with you, man, always. You too, Tyler. Thank you, buddy. Doug Flynn, Gold Glove Award winner. Doug, let's talk about first the shortstop position because it looks a little bit different these days from, from when you played it. Uh, there's a new rule in place, you know, at the second base bag. If, you know, a runner goes and, and a fielder blocks him, he's automatically safe. I'd like your opinion on that as well as just a lot of the changes in the game that we're seeing today. <laughs> well, if you talk to any of the old players, of course, we're going to say we hated it because we got the tart beat out of us. Especially in the old days, middle infielders, we were all – under six foot tall, we weighed under 200 pounds. So that was, uh, we took a lot of pride in learning how to get the ball, get the out, turn the double play and get out of the way. There was an art to that. Now there's not much of an art to it because if you make any kind of contact then the guy's gonna be out. So no, I don't like it. I think you've taken away a part of the game that people like to watch and see and a part of the beauty of the game where guys were having to throw and jump and avoid stuff and it was, usually got your picture in the paper, too, so that's why it was pretty cool. But there's a whole lot of the rules now that are changing, and the kids are getting so much bigger and stronger than we were. I mean, Cal Ripken screwed it up for everybody when he started playing shortstop, you know, a 6'4 shortstop. And now you look around, and guys are 6'3". You got some that are 6'5", 6'6". Uh, and so the game has really changed. The kids are bigger, stronger. Uh, I'm not so sure they're a lot better, but uh, there are some quality athletes playing the game today. Absolutely. And and you played with, with some quality athletes. You were a, among the 75-76 World Series mm -hmm. championship winning Reds. To be amidst not only a World Series team, but arguably a combination of the best two teams of all time when you look at and break it down, what's it like to not only be a fly on the wall, but to be a member of those teams? <laughs> Well, my rookie year uh, was 75. I made the team coming out of spring training and had uh, just an, an unbelievably good offensive spring training, which I was not a very good offensive player. My glove really kept me around the game for a long time. So going to spring training, walking into the locker room and seeing Rose and Bench and Perez and Morgan and uh, just the big names. And then you got Foster and Griffey and Geronimo and Concepcion, those guys that could just were really good players. Uh, and to watch the way they went about getting themselves ready for spring training. They, a lot of them came, they weren't really in shape, but they would use spring training to get themselves ready for opening day. And they all had a different way of doing it, and it was kind of unique in watching how they all would do it in a different way. Most of us as young kids trying to make the club, you better come in shape, and you better be ready to go. And that's what happened that year. I came in really good shape and had been playing ball in Florida a little bit, so... Uh, I knew that Davey would probably be late from Venezuela. Joe would come and work his way in. Most likely I was going to get a chance to play early, and I did. I ended up having 90 at-bats in spring training, which is a lot, uh, but fortunate to have 32 uh, hits. So Sparky kept me – Sparky, he never did tell me I made the team, but he never did tell me that I didn't, so I just hung on, <laughs> jumped on the plane and came up north with him. And then to watch the way they prepared during the season – they were the ultimate pros when it came time to play in baseball. Uh, off the field, I don't know what they were doing because I was a rookie and I had to be in because I had curfew. But on the field, they knew who was going to be pitching three weeks in advance. They knew the moves. They knew who had speed. They knew everything. They didn't need any cards. They were students of the game, as smart as anybody I've ever been around as far as baseball knowledge. And so you figured that if they started putting it all together – what people don't understand, there was a lot of pressure on that team because they got beaten 70 uh, by Baltimore, 72 got beat by Oakland. 73, uh, the Mets beat them in the playoffs. 74, they weren't around. So now here you have the big red machine, but they've never won it. Uh, so 75, when we went in to play Boston, there was a lot of pressure on those guys. And as you know, it was a, a well-played, very close uh, and hotly contested World Series. Ab absolutely, and and you mentioned him earlier. I want to go in depth. Tell me about Sparky. Mm. Sparky was the kind of guy that loved veteran ball players. So the fact that I made the team was really unique. They already had somebody's utility infielder, Daryl Cheney, and Daryl uh, was the guy who really taught me how to be a professional. Uh, sitting down at the end of the bench, listening to him talk to uh, Bill Plummer and Terry Crowley and Merv Retman, some of the other guys. 
how they were preparing if they had to go in for fielding or if they had to go pinch hit or if they had to play on a day. And they really taught me how to get myself ready. And believe me, on that day, you need to be ready every day because you never knew when you're going to play. You might go out and get your work done, and then all of a sudden sit down to start to enjoy the game, and they say, oh, by the way, you're playing shortstop or you're playing second base. So Daryl taught me that, and that's probably why you know I love him to death and our friendship has lasted this many years. Uh, because you don't hear a lot about the extra guys that were on those teams. You only hear about eight players, basically. You don't hear a lot about our pitching staff, which was really, really good. Uh, so the rest of us, we kind of had a name for each other. We were actually nicknamed uh, by one of our coaches. He called those of us that weren't playing every day turds. <laughs> and uh, I guess we were. Uh, and, and it was more of a term of endearment. But, you know, we, uh, we took a lot of pride in that, in that, that when we got an opportunity is to come in and contribute and then when they stuck us in the lineup with the big red machine, you know, there there wasn't a lot of drop off, believe me. Uh, absolutely, and you know, you mentioned your defense. You were nicknamed the glue. You know, <laughs> and that's a long. Well, that was hey, a self-proclaimed nickname. <laughs> not not everybody wins a gold glove, you know. But, you know, these days I, I would argue that defense is a little bit overlooked compared to offense. It really is today, and plus. I mean, I watch balls today where guys are going through their legs and they're off just off the glove and their base hits, and you go, you know, in the old days, you better catch it clean or you're going to get an error. That's just the way it was. But the glue started. <laughs> it's really uh, – and we're having some fun with it. I always wanted to do something to give back to military charities. So we did a banquet one night, and I introduced the starting eight, the grade eight. And I looked down and I told the people, I said, ladies and gentlemen, the most overrated – group of players in the history of the game. And everybody's, what's he doing? I said, well, let's do some history. And I told them they got beaten 70, they got beaten 72, beaten 73. Little country boy makes a team in 75. We win the World <laughs> Series. Little country boy's back. We win again in 1976. We win the World Series again. They trade the little country boy in 77, and they don't win again. So, obviously, I must have been the glue. And, Doug, you know, you need players like that on any team that's going to be successful. You need players that can fill a role. You were filling a role behind a Hall of Famer and Joe Morgan, middle infield. And it should be Hall of Famer. And it should be Hall of Famer and Dave Concepcion. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you look up to those guys and, and maybe follow their lead and, and take from them and learn from them? Well, you watch them because – and you really don't have to go force yourself upon them. When they have you on that ball club, and from what I understand, those four guys, Bench Rose, Perez, and Morgan, they had a lot of input as to who made the club as far as extra guys, who they thought would benefit, could fill in. So <clears throat> they didn't want the team to look bad. When I got to play or Daryl or, you know, anybody else got to go into the game, they wanted us to, you know, you're getting in this lineup and we expect you to perform like we're performing well. That kind of ups your game a little bit. I mean, the two best hitting years I had were in Cincinnati because, you know, it's just they – you were supposed to hit, so you did. And and you didn't feel like you were a second-class citizen and your job is to catch it, not to hit it. Well, in Cincinnati, the, let's go. And it was it made you feel empowered that each time you went on the field, I'm playing with some of the best I ever played, and they're pulling for me to do well as well. And so you just watch the way they handle things, watch their demeanor, and uh, they were they're certainly uh, – and in the two years that we had there, after we won in 75, 76, we just rolled. Uh, because the monkey was off their bat. And then, of course, they started making changes after that. And, and I teased them that they didn't win again. But they said, well, you didn't either. And I well, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about some postseason moments. Mm. The one, to me, that sticks out in everybody's mind was not a Reds highlight. It was a Boston Red Sox mm. highlight. Why? Well, you know, Carlton Fisk. Oh, that's the World Series that uh, they won three to four. Yeah, that, yeah. that's what they say. <laughs> I, I, t I talk really brash about that. That was such a fun time, though. But everybody says, what were you thinking of? Well, you know, when we got up six to three, I think it was, uh, and Raleigh Eastwood was in the game, and you just feel like, all right, we're right where we want to be. We're going to win this thing. And then Carbo fouls off an unbelievable pitch that we thought he was struck out. And, and then the next pitch, he hits it out of the park to tie the game. And then, <clears throat> of course, everybody remembers the Fisk home run. But – I uh, said, so what were you thinking? And I'll never forget, after the game's over, my locker was near Pete Rose's. And a writer came in and said, Pete, you got to be devastated. Uh, I said, you had it won. This is the final thing to solidify the greatness of the big red machine. And Pete said, what do you mean devastated? He said, 
Tomorrow we're playing in the seventh game of the World Series. We've got our best pitcher going. There's going to be millions of people watching. We'll be the only game in town. He said, I can't wait. And I thought, I'm sitting here thinking, man, we could have had a ring. We could have had an extra $15,000, which is what basically you got yeah. back then for winning. And uh, But Pete, and so the next night we went out. Of course, we had that rain delay up there too. We were there for a couple extra days. and We were taking our shirts and washing them out in the shower and then turning the hot water on to dry them off. And, you know, we didn't have any money to go out because we were making 15000 a year, I think. So you just didn't have that extra money. But the whole thing, the raining, going over to a college, taking batting practice, the Boston fans screaming in your ear, it was just – you know, it was really cool. And I think probably the older that I get, the more I appreciate just how special that was. Absolutely. And then, inevitably, you guys do end up taking the series. What what kind of emotions is that? I mean, I know it's got to be a huge payoff. Yeah. But what kind of celebration is that with Big Red Machine? It, it was relief, I think. When you see Johnny, Johnny says it's the greatest thing in the world for him because he said, not for him personally, but he said, I got to share that with 24 of my buddies. And uh, Sparky certainly was well-deserved. I mean, it was just a unique team. We had uh, a lot of different personalities, but everybody pulling for the same thing. Those of us that weren't playing weren't bad-mouthing the guys that were. We were trying to learn from them. And you don't see a lot of that, I don't think, anymore. Uh, so, yeah, we, the celebration was good. We got back about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, I think, from Boston, and there was 40,000 people waiting on us at the square. And so that's both World Series we won on the road. And we got back late at night. There were thousands of people out there waiting. And, you know, Boston, I think a few of us, we got to go out on the field, but just briefly. Yeah. Because, I mean, people were coming from everywhere, and the cops were telling us, get off. The next year when we beat the Yankees, they told us just when the last out was made, get in the locker room. We couldn't go on the field at all because there was so much people hollering bad stuff. <laughs> well, you know, New York is not exactly uh, gentle with, with their, with uh, their no. feelings Well, I got to all. play there four years, so I know. <laughs> Well, you, you've played for a lot of teams. I think you're most uh, cherished by the Reds because of the two World Series and really because of their fan base. And if you could just speak to, you know, the unique fan base that is Cincinnati. Well, it's, you know, they, they, the history shows, you know, they go back when it all started. And I lived 80 miles from there. So growing up that close to Cincinnati, uh, I grew up watching Frank Robinson, Veda Pinson, and Ed Bailey, and, you know, those guys play ball and, and thought, wow. Veda Pinson, I thought, was just the coolest dude in the I world. I think he belongs in the Hall of Fame. He's got 2,800 hits. Why is he not in the Hall of Fame? Agreed. So, uh, he was just – and I actually, my last year with Detroit, he was coaching with Sparky, and I got to ride to the ballpark with him every day and just w was such a class act. He was just a wonderful person. And, you know, I'll never forget the talks that we'd have on the way to the ballpark and or on the way home. It was just so good. Uh but, you know, the game is now, it's, uh, it, it's a whole lot different than it was. Uh, I wish they'd quit screwing with it so much, you know, like the play at plate, you know, the Buster Posey rule. Just, you know, I like seeing guys, I mean, that's, that's part of the game, blocking the plate. You know, getting hurt's part of the game. Uh, at second base, I wish they'd do that. I don't like the bases being that much bigger. I don't know what they're doing, if the hell that helps. The, the clock, pitching clock, uh, is okay with me. I think they ought to be teaching guys to work faster anyway. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why they've never, you know, they haven't done that. But, you know, the replays have changed everything. You can't see a manager coming out arguing like he used to. People used to love that. Yeah. Now they don't do it because they got the replay. And there's just, uh, there's a lot of stuff. I hope they're careful with what they're doing with the game and don't change so much of it that, uh, you know, we're not going to recognize it. I mean, the game was pretty good for 150 years. Uh, let's not mess with it too much. I mean, they're so stat-driven with everything now. Uh, but there's a couple of things that stats don't check. They can't check the heart. And they can't check a couple other things. And so, <laughs> you know, I hope they don't mess with it too much. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree with you. And you, I mentioned earlier you played for a lot of teams, the Mets, the Reds, the Expos, and, and, and I'm sure many others. But you played with two Hall of Fame catchers. We, we talked about it earlier. You spoke about how different they were. Yeah. If you could talk to me about both Johnny Bench and, and Gary Carter. Well, uh, Johnny's just the best. I mean, if you, he's the best I ever saw, and I think he's the best it's ever been. Uh, he had a uniqueness. He had such good feet that he always got himself in a good position to throw. He could block balls. Where guys are sliding over, blocking them with their chest, he's picking it barehand or backhanded. 
uh, and he hit a cannon behind the plate. He got rid of it so quick, and I mean, rarely did you ever see a ball not on the button. Uh, Gary was a little different. Gary certainly, you, nobody threw like Johnny. So uh, they were two different kinds of guys, you know. Uh, stats are probably pretty close. Uh, the one thing about them both is they were very durable and they could play a lot. They didn't want anybody else to play. Excuse me, I miss, uh, I miss Gary, you know, got to play with him for four years and then uh, got to see him, you know, a little bit afterwards as we do some functions. But, uh, yeah, both of them just very good and both of them a credit to our game. Ab absolutely. You, you mentioned this guy earlier. He's a guy who I have a real soft spot for. It's Pete Rose. If you could just talk about what kind of teammate he was. The best. Made everybody around him better. Came to the ballpark, concentrated on every single pitch, could tell you what was going on in the stands and what was going on on the field. And if you weren't hustling, he'd come up and he had a way of just talking to you where you'd, you know, you'd realize, all right, I need to up my game a little bit. Uh, he's, he was funny. I got my first hit, and here he comes bringing my glove and my hat out, and I'm thinking, wow, this is cool. Pete Rose will bring me my glove and my hat out. There's 50,000 people there, and he just throws it and hits me in the stomach, and he says, you're only 2,500 behind me. <laughs> Kept running on out to the outfield. <laughs> and then, of course, he came into third base. I mean, you look, I was an all-star at four or five different positions. Uh, played hard, didn't have the best ability. Uh, I mean, he couldn't run as fast as people. He couldn't throw as good as some guys. By golly, he is a gamer. I mean, he could. He was tough as nails. And uh, I think now, I've changed my mind now. I used to think, all right, what he did, he doesn't belong in the Hall of Fame. But since baseball now has adopted the bet on every single pitch, every action that goes on in the game, if that's the way they're going to play it, then Pete Rose put all to go in the Hall of Fame. He's in mine. You know, he's I, in a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. I, he introduced me to my wife, so I've been married 42 years. And that's why he's in your Hall of Fame. That's why he's there. in my Hall of Fame. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, you know, I, I hope one day he gets in, as, as I'm sure you and, and many others that are here at this tournament yep. do as well. But let's talk about the tournament. We're here for Daryl Cheney, who we who we spoke about earlier, and Daryl's been great to me. I know he's been great to you yeah. as a friend. But talk to me about the cause. Talk to me about the reason you're here. Daryl Cheney. Yeah. That's why I'm here. He, uh, he's a friend. He's been a friend since 1975, probably 74. I met him. I got two weeks up with the, at uh, spring training. And then 75, just here's a guy that could have been rude to me if he wanted to, but he wasn't because I was trying for his position. And then so 75, we're together. He gets traded the next year. He gets to play every day with Atlanta. And we've just remained friends. Uh, he's, he's one of the funniest people I've ever been around. We both love to fish. Uh, when he puts his name on something, then his friends are going to come and support him. Obviously, it's a good cause here, coming down to Helen and and uh, and raising money. But uh, I, I think we all do it because of our love for Daryl. Uh, him and Cindy, uh, I mean, they've been married 56, 57 years. Are you kidding me? Hey, that's amazing. Yeah. And just getting together with them and fellowshipping. I mean, he's a godly man. He's a good Christian man. And, and – uh, when people say, who made the biggest difference in helping you get to where you got professionally, I say, it's Daryl Cheney. And some people say, who's that? No, it, it doesn't matter who. You, you don't have to know him. Uh, I know him. And, uh, you know, and he's a great broadcaster. He's, he's just going to do so much. But, yeah, uh, and this, this place is beautiful. I mean, uh, what a nice drive. Come to a nice community like this. And it's like a family reunion now. Yeah. People treat you so good. I'm just I'm hoping this is regular. He said one day. We're going to have to start getting some younger people here. And I would talk about you. You're three years older than I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I hope we keep doing this year after year. It's always good to see folks like you, Doug. Thanks. And uh, I really appreciate you being here and My doing pleasure. this interview. Thank you. Thank My you very pleasure. much. Yes, sir. Baseball fans, make sure you like and share this video and subscribe to this channel. As always, thank you for your support.